Well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Scott Swanson, and for the second week in a row, I get the privilege to be the host for the Field of Fork webinar. Uh, Julie's actually attending another conference this week. I think she's actually in Grand Forks, which is where Carrie's actually joining us from today. So kind of funny there. Um, as always, uh, Field of Fork is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. This is our ninth year we've done this series, and so we're so glad you've been able to join us today. We have archived all the previous webinars from the past years, and the links are on the Field of Fork webinar page. We're also providing a certificate of attendance on the website, so you can find that uh, where it's posted with the recordings. The next slide will show the upcoming webinars. Uh, there is one left, and so we hope you can join us for that, the final one for the season. Uh, the following slide shows the webinar controls. I know many of you are familiar with these, but we'll just go over it one more time. Because of our large number of participants, we invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat. So go ahead and find that, like many of you are already starting to do. Go ahead and click on the, the uh, chat in the bottom, uh, the middle of your Zoom screen there. Go ahead and type in your city and state. Don't worry about the Q&A box. We can just take questions in the chat. So while you're doing that, um, with the next slide provides an acknowledgement. So we have a special request. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agric Agricultural Marketing Service. So we'll ask you to complete a short online survey they will be emailed right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, we're going to provide some prizes to the lucky winners of a random drawing. You will need to scroll down a little bit because we're compiling uh, results from about for, from two years. So they'll, 2023 will be on there. So scroll down a little further to find 2024. So again, welcome to today's webinar. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker. Carrie Knutson is the horticulture, horticulture agent in Grand Forks County. She received her master's degree in horticulture from North Dakota State University. Carrie has been with NDSU Extension for 17 years. Plants, gardening, and soils are her passions. Her favorite programs are youth gardening and going out on house calls to help county residents with their horticulture issues. Carrie, take it away. All right, thank you, Scott, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Today, as we learn how to welcome nature into our landscapes. So why should we care about welcoming nature into our landscapes? So we're going to start with a couple facts. I always like statistics to kind of set the story. Uh, according to the International Union of Conservation for Nature's Red List of Threatened and Endangered Species, there are more than 44,000 species that are threatened with extinction across the globe. These species range from amphibians, mammals, to conifers, birds, sharks, reef corals, crustaceans, reptiles, and insects like cicadas. In addition, according to Douglas Tallamy in his 2022 guest editorial article for the University of Wisconsin Press Journal of Ecological Restoration, North America has lost about 3 billion breeding birding, birding pairs over the past 50 years. The earth has lost about 45% of its insects with continuing decline. And the UN predicts that about 1 million species will go extinct in the next 20 years. So regardless of whether you believe those facts or not, you can't deny that humans have impacted and changed our environment. Our environment is becoming more and more urbanized. Uh, through buildings and agriculture uses as well, and wildlife habitat is becoming extremely fragmented. So what can we do to help as gardeners? Well, there's about 69 million acres of land in the U.S. that is in urban landscapes, and our choices of what we do with that land and our urban landscapes can impact our environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about or think of our backyards as being little ecosystems. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, the definition of an ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So we need to think of our homes as many ecosystems that fit within the larger ecosystems in our area. They're gonna serve as habitat for wildlife and hopefully connect small and larger habitats together. Today, we're gonna to focus on practices that will help our gardens become more environmentally friendly, sustainable, and welcoming to our native wildlife. No one topic is important. I kind of have a mind map here about the, the different things that we can do um, to welcome nature into our landscapes. Some of the things you might not agree with, and that's fine too. We all have our opinions and our beliefs and how we like to operate in our gardens. 
But my purpose is to get you thinking about how your landscape choices affect the ecosystems in your landscape. We're going to start with climate. Climate is overarching when it comes to our landscapes. It tells us what we can or can't, or maybe what we should and shouldn't grow in our backyards. This is the map of the 2023 USDA plant hardiness zones, and hopefully you've all seen that. If you haven't, um, it was just updated this past year, and it's the average temperatures from 1991 to 2020. And gardeners use this as a guide uh, for hardiness zones, so they know what plants will survive basically the cold winter temperatures in their area. As I mentioned, it gives the averages. Um, it doesn't take into effect uh, the lows, the extreme lows that we can have. It also doesn't take into effect um, wind or fluctuations in temperatures. And I think we all might have noticed uh, this spring, especially where I'm from um, in central east North Dakota, we had a huge swing in temperatures in January. The temperatures got warm um, in the 50s or 40s during the day. Luckily, they cooled off at night, but it will be interesting to see how the plants that weren't quite hardy, that were maybe should have been in a little bit uh, higher zone, how they handle those fluctuations in temperatures. So it's always important to keep in mind our hardiness zones. It will help, um, help you get the most out of your money that you're spending in your gardens as well. When we talk about climate, we also have seasonality when it comes to our plants. And that is just basically uh, their blooming season or when they're going to grow. You know, talk about cool or warm season plants or plants that bloom right away in the spring when there's still snow on the ground or plants that bloom really late into the fall, sometimes after a frost. When we talk about microclimates, um, we have microclimates in our landscapes. They're Areas that differ in growing conditions that can be light, temperature, uh, precipitation, or exposure to wind. And this can be influenced by structures or the topography you might have in your backyard. And as gardeners, this is a way you can take advantage of some climate differences and maybe start some plants earlier or keep some things growing later. And the thing that is really easy to do to help you understand your microclimates is to keep a climate journal. It will help you be aware of the temperature fluctuations. I know as I age, I don't remember things as well. So if something maybe didn't come up this year or there's some dead branches on a tree, you can look back and think what's happened over the past several years that might have caused some dieback in your plants. Moving on to soil, we could spend the whole time discussing soils. I love talking about soil, but there's just a few key points that I want to cover. First of all, when it comes to the plants that we choose to put in our landscape, certain plants have specific needs. And it's important to know what your soil texture is because that affects the amount of water that a soil will hold, its nutrient holding capacity, and the amount of organic matter it's gonna accumulate. So this is a picture of a soil texture triangle. It has sand on the bottom, clay on my left side, and then silt on the right. And what we have in the middle is a gardener's favorite soil. It's a loam soil. So a loam soil has a good mixture of all three of those soil particles. So it allows it to hold on to water fairly easily, but allows drainage so you don't have our wet soils. So if you know your soil texture that you're working with in your landscape, you will be able to have a better decision making when it comes to your plants. For example, a soil that has a higher clay content is going to hold on to more water and will potentially have wet feet for your plant if you want to think of it that way. An example of a plant that would like wet feet is swamp milkweed. It's going to grow better in a moist soil. Second, when we talk about soil, I think it's important to do a soil test to determine what the nutrient levels are in your soil. They're recommended every few years for lawns or gardens. In the landscape, you know, around uh, your, your house, your foundation and things like that, that would depend on your soil type and texture, your landscape needs and plant preferences. 
but it'll give you some background information is to know if you need to apply additional nutrients. A soil test will also tell you your soil's pH. Uh, it's important for us when we're talking about the right plant for the right place, knowing the pH preference of your plants will help you make good planting decisions. So the example that I like to use is blueberries. Uh, where I am from, we have very high soil pHs, uh, 7.9 to 8, depending on where you're at. And blueberries just aren't going to grow well, no matter how well you amend that soil. So there are other things that we can plant that will do well besides blueberries. Finally, as we wrap up our discussion on soils, I want you to think of soil as its own ecosystem as well. It is a place full of living things. Those can be large, uh, like gophers, or voles or moles that live in the soil. They can be earthworms, bacteria, fungi, other microbes, and then plant roots. All these organisms live in the soil and have a function in the soil. Soil is a living thing. It's going to cycle organic matter, break down nutrients, and have that available to plants. So we want to make sure that we have a healthy soil that's full of life for our plants and the ecosystem in our backyard. A couple more points about soil. If you don't know what your soil texture is, if you don't uh, want to go out and texture your soil because it can be a little bit subjective, I'm still learning how to texture a soil and and tell specifically what percentages of those three particles are in it. An easy place to go is the USDA NRCS web soil survey. It's kind of like a Google Earth map. You can type in an address or you can type in section information and you can zoom into an area and pull up a soil map. It will give you basic information as to what your soil texture is and what your soil pH is. So that's good information to have. And I also want to note topography one more time. When we are planning out our landscapes and what we want to do with them, keep them in mind. High and low areas are going to function differently for us. We might have to select different plants. Uh, pick species that are going to thrive well in low areas where there might be water accumulating at times or higher areas if they're drier, especially in a sandy soil, that can do well with less moisture. All right, talking about plants, when we think of plants in our landscape, right away we think of what they're going to do for us. Are they going to provide us beauty? something to look at, something to talk with other gardeners about, something to share with our neighbors. Are they going to give us food? Uh, are they going to give us shelter? You know, thinking of forest and timber production and things like that. Are they going to protect us from the wind and provide some shade? But how often when you're selecting a plant, do you think of what that plant provides other animals and wildlife in our ecosystems? Plants are just important to wildlife in our backyards as they are to us. They provide wildlife in our backyard with food and shelter. And some insects have very specific, excuse me, some insects and animals have very specific needs when it comes to plants. Others are generalists. So an example of an insect that needs specific plants would be like the butterflies where their larva or their caterpillar has a very specific host plant and the adult butterfly uh, might feed on nectar and pollen from various plants. When we talk about plants, they have needs themselves and we kind of talked a little bit about this when we we're talking about climate and soil. Everything's kind of connected, but plants have different light needs, water needs, and soil texture therefore and different pH needs. So this is where the term right plant, right place comes into play. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. And sometimes as gardeners, we like the challenge of growing something according to our climate and soil conditions that we should not be able to grow. Whether it's something that we have to heavily mulch or heal into the ground so it can overwinter, you know, that's an expense of time and resources for us. Whether it's something like those blueberries that require a lower pH soil, you know, constantly trying to amend the soil and make something work maybe is not the best use of your time and resources as well as other things. 
So start thinking about the plants that you're choosing to put in your landscape. Are they going to fit in what you with what you have? How much work do you have to give them to make them grow well? Also, when we're talking about right plant, right place, a lot of error that we make when it comes to selecting plants is not thinking about the mature size or spread of plants. Uh, during my travels in the county, I see a lot of times shrubs are planted right up against the foundation of a house and they have to be removed because they're causing problems. Our large trees are planted in backyards, you know, huge elms that are 100 feet tall, towering over, over a home. So it's important to think about the mature size. We want our landscapes filled right away, but maybe there's other things that we can do to give our plants space and allow them to grow in. A discussion on plants wouldn't be complete about a discussion talking about native or invasive plants. There's lots of thoughts out there on natives and non-native plants. Sometimes even some plant shaming when it comes to people using non-native plants. That's not my intent for anything today. I just want you to encourage, about, encourage you to think about the plants that you're using in their landscape. Now, when we talk about native plants, they are plants that have naturally involved, evolved in a region and without human interaction. They are, and the wildlife that we have has evolved with it as well. So they have a system. They transfer energy into the animals and insects in our ecosystems. And they usually require less resources to grow because they are adapted to the growing conditions. Invasive plants, um, it seems like everywhere you turn and everything you think about uh, growing, sometimes a new plant pops up all the time. These are essentially non-native plants. They can be native as well, uh, but essentially non-native plants that uh, might crowd out other plants. They don't provide any fuel or ecosystem services into the wildlife or habitat, and they spread and kind of take over. So when you're doing your plant research, it's important to kind of make sure that you're not inadvertently buying something that would become invasive. And as I was putting together information for this presentation, there is a wealth of information out there when it comes to native plants. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but make sure you do your research so that you're actually getting something that is native to your area and will go well in your conditions. When we talk about native plants, the eco it was based on ecoregions developed by the EPA for their environmental study and conservation work. There's a lot of websites that base their native plant uh, information on the e on these EPA ecosystems. And they're based on some of the things that we've talked about already, uh, landforms, soil, what the vegetation is, climate, what the land use pattern is, and hydrology or water. So when we talk about native plants, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different resources out there. Uh, these are just a few that I've found that seem to have good research-based information. There's always extension offices that you can turn to in your states for uh, information as well. Um, in North Dakota, the North Dakota Game and Fish has good information on, on pollinators and wildlife that's native to our areas as well and what growing conditions or excuse me, what plant conditions or what habitat they need to grow. And there's the Xerces Society, USDA Plant ba Database, and then Homegrown National Park. Uh, so they are uh, good places to look for when you're searching uh, for native plants. Uh, my point, or today, my purpose is not to go through what's native and what's not, but just to give you some information, where to look to find those native plants before you put something in your backyard. All right, moving on from plants to wildlife. Uh, sometimes we have goals in our landscape. Maybe there's a specific uh, bird or insect, like monarch butterflies, that you want to attract that's native to your area. You're going to need to do your research to determine what you need to put in your landscape to attract and provide habitat for that wildlife animal. For example, in North Dakota, many of our native birds require short, tall, or mixed grass prairies, which is essentially non-existent in our urban environments. 
So we need to think about how we're going, if that's something you wanted to attract, how are we going to install a prairie or a meadow garden into your landscape? There's lots of different animals and we talk about what we want to attract to our landscape. Sometimes we might not want to attract them. The um, birds and rabbits can sometimes be pests in our gardens, as well as deer, skunks, and raccoons, but they are all part of kind of the natural ecosystem. One thing that we might not think about and kind of gets a bad rap sometimes are our insects that are in our backyard. Insects can be the basis of many food webs. Uh, there are many birds that feed on them, or reptiles as well. And inviting nature into our landscapes can be as simple as putting up with some insects in our backyard. So I wanted to note this picture on the slide. This is, uh, now the name escapes me, but I believe it's just a, a garden spider in our backyard. Uh, I was in the house one day working something on something and my kids come running in. Mom, mom, there's this huge spider in the backyard. I take it with a grain of salt. You know, the little spiders sometimes we get in the house, the kids kind of flip out over. But I went out there and I was surprised to see this large spider uh, that made this really cool web on the peony shrub in our backyard. So I did a little research. I emailed our extension entomologist to confirm the identification that it was just a garden spider that isn't gonna hurt us unless we physically try to disturb it. And it's actually good for a garden environment. It does prey on insects, sometimes bees. So I wasn't so happy to hear that. But it was a good lesson for myself, my kids and my family, just because there's something there that scares us. Um, as long as we know we stay away from it and try not to bug it, it's not gonna hurt us. I mean, granted, there are times we need to uh, control. If the spider was in our house, we talked about how we might react differently to it and capture it and try to move it out of the house. But I was really excited to see this in the backyard. I took it as a good sign that I was um, creating a good ecosystem where I could welcome the spider into our backyard. Also, when we talk about wildlife, we need to make sure that we provide for their basic needs as well, just like we do for plants. We need to have uh, plants that would serve as a food source for them, plants that provide a shelter and something a water source for them as well. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. So plants for wildlife. So how do we get plants into our landscape to welcome wildlife? Well, it's as simple as planting diverse plants, creating a diverse landscape. And depending on your perspective, most of the plants can be native or should be native. I don't want you to think that you have to go out and redo your yard or replace everything. But just as you're moving around or adding things to your landscape, think about adding those native plants just because of the resources that they're gonna provide for wildlife. You also wanna spread out the bloom time of things that you have in your backyard. You know, a lot of the principles for welcoming wildlife in general will be things that we would do to welcome pollinators to our gardens. We're gonna spread out the bloom times. We're gonna have a variety of plants blooming at different times and at the same times. And then we want to think about um, adding structure to our garden. So there's that habitat, that safe space. So it's not only the blooming or flowering plants, it can be uh, trees or shrubs that provide a structure and it could be grasses as well. And we often have a lot of wasted space in our landscapes. I encourage people to landscape next to their houses instead of just those um, foundations with a few hydrangeas or bar barberries or things like that we can grow vegetables and herbs and different things like that next to our houses to give some habitat for wildlife. You can mix ornamentals and edibles that way. I mentioned herbs. You can also use annuals. Um, I don't, you know, I said use native plants. We want a majority of our species to be native plants. That's not knocking our herbs or annuals that can be valuable sources of pollen and nectar uh, for our insects. So you can do herbs as well. When we talk about plants for wildlife, I wanna talk about garden cleanup. As gardeners, uh, as people in general, we tend to have like, wanna have this 
nice clean landscape and that's not what wildlife needs for habitat so what we want to see in our landscape is not always what they need it's not pleasing to us you know our insects and animals need places to overwinter so these could be on mowed grassy areas they could be uh, leaf debris and stem debris that have accumulated over the years it's just places for them to overwinter our insects, a lot of our bees, our native bees are solitary and a large percentage of them also nest in the ground. So it's important to leave some bare ground, especially if you have a sandier soil and allow those bees to go in there and nest as well. When we talk about garden cleanup, uh, I encourage everybody to just wait and to be lazy. This year is a key example. I think I saw people starting to clean up their gardens as early as mid-March because we didn't have any snow to stop us and the temperatures were, were nice for us to be outside. And after a long winter, that's what we want to do. But that's not what a lot of our wildlife needs, especially our insects. Uh, so our bees and other insects, they're going to overwinter and they're going to stay and dormant until temperatures get consistently in the 50s. So I encourage gardeners to wait on garden cleanup until that time. Um, a good rule of thumb is if you're comfortable putting out your peppers and tomatoes, then you can do garden cleanup. And you also want to think about leaving that material. I uh, Leaving leaves lay where they fall is kind of a new term in gardening. And if you have stems, um, like this is a picture in my backyard. It still looks like this today. It's a little bit greener. The grass is a little bit greener but I kind of have a mess of stems. These were cosmos that the bumblebees just loved last year. So I also use um, some non-natives in my gardening as well. I'm just gonna cut those stems down to a foot, uh, maybe two feet, we'll see how, I, how they look, but I'm gonna leave that material there for uh, insects to nest in or stay in over the summer and then throughout next winter, kind of building that habitat for them. So we've kind of gone through a few things that we can do to welcome nature into our landscape and I'm going to pick on welcoming insects to our landscapes, kind of walking through an example and talk about the monarch butterfly. That's something that everybody can relate to. And the monarch butterfly, the larvae require a specific plant host, the milkweed plants or milkweed species. So when you want to welcome monarch butterflies into your landscape or provide something for them, you want to make sure that you have milkweed species in your garden, not just one plant, but you want to have a few, few milkweed species in your landscape. And then the caterpillars are going to eat and feed on that, but they also need a place, a secure structure that they can hook onto when they form their chrysalis to become a butterfly. So that could be uh, structures like trees or shrubs. It could be like a bench or a fence or something like that. Uh, I also want to know when we're talking about garden cleanup, I forgot to mention this, but leaving uh, dead uh, trees and branches also provides habitat for wildlife. Um, the one caveat with leaving things in your yard, as long as it's disease free and isn't going to attract uh, any unwanted pests in your yard as well. Getting back to ladybugs, so, or excuse me, uh, monarch butterflies. So the caterpillar is ate on that milkweed, it's formed the chrysalis and it's, it's come out of its cocoon or the chrysalis. And that adult butterfly needs nectar sources and pollen sources to feed on, nectar sources to feed on so that it can continue on its journey. So if we just provide one thing in our landscape for that monarch butterfly, it doesn't have everything it needs. One more important thing that our wildlife needs is water. Water is essential to all of us and wildlife is no exception. The water sources that we put into our landscapes do not have to be fancy. They can be as simple as a plant saucer filled with water to act as a bird, bird bath. What's important is that you keep it filled because animals, will, animals and insects alike will begin to rely on it and you want to keep it clean. So keeping it clean be, may be replacing the water every day or every week. It may be taking a brush out there and cleaning away the algae that might grow on the sides of it. When we have a water source for our wildlife, we can place it in a shady area. 
that's, it might help prevent any algae growth or it might encourage it depending on your conditions. But you want to put it in an area where wildlife are going to feel comfortable accessing it. So that's why it's important to put it next to some trees or shrubs or taller plants. That's what they've done right in this picture. They have placed the bird bath by some shrubs so it's comfortable access for wildlife. What they haven't done right is they haven't kept the water clean in that bird bath. So it's something that we want to keep in mind. You can also add a fountain to your bird bath to keep the water moving. That will also help with algae growth. And you might attract different wildlife um, that would prefer to, to go through a sprinkling of water versus drinking from the bird bath itself. When we are installing water features into our landscapes, we want to make sure that it has slope sides or access so that wildlife can get out if it gets in there. When we talked about the monarch butterfly, another thing that butterflies need are access to water too, and other pollinators do as well. So you can do this by you know, having a shallow dish with some rocks or pebbles in it that allow the insect to kind of perch on the rock and get a drink. Butterflies also need a puddling dish or a puddling area. It's essentially an area where the soil stays wet all the time and the butterflies can land and pick up minerals and nutrients through the mud there. Uh, if you are in an area that's drier, uh, we've had dry conditions throughout North Dakota, it might be as simple as putting some soil in a saucer and keeping that soil wet uh, for the butterflies. It's probably easier than trying to keep the ground moist at this point. Ponds are another good um, source of water in our landscapes. They're bigger, they're more extravagant, expensive, uh, and they're, gonna, they're going to welcome different wildlife as well. So ponds are a good thing. Uh, there's a whole nother uh, issue, not issues, but there's all concerns with caring for them and overwintering as well. But at least providing a small water source like a bird bath is great for a wildlife. If you don't, don't have a pond or don't wanna do a pond, if you have a bird bath on a pedestal, you could put a bird bath just kind of buried in the ground and that will welcome a different type of wildlife as well. All right, moving on to ground covers. We mentioned that a good healthy soil is good for our plants. It's a living ecosystem. And a way that we can keep healthy soil healthy is to cover it. It also helps prevent erosion too. So many, uh, covers that we use for landscapes, and some of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Rock mulch is very popular. People like to use it because it doesn't blow away into the wind. Uh, and there's drawbacks to rock, rock mulch. It might have its places. I have it in my backyard because it was there when we moved in and I'm slowly trying to get rid of it over the years. But rock mulch is not the best environment for plants. It holds on to heat and it doesn't support any wildlife. There's no organic matter uh, being put into the soil. Uh, there really isn't a lot of space for things to hide unless you have those, it's, unless it's over the soil and you have soil dwelling insects. So think, rethink your mulch choices if you're redoing some landscaping. Turf grass, depending on how you use it, if you have a, you know, you use your outdoor space. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a turf grass, a grass area uh, as well. It just depends on how it's maintained, how much extra resources you're putting into it. Uh, we mentioned a soil test. A soil test is key to make sure that you are not putting too much uh, fertilizer on it than is necessary. There's also been a push in research for bee lawns, including clover, uh, some uh, perennials like cell feel in there, in there to help attract the pollinators and give back to the ecosystem. Mulch is another method for covering soil. They help suppress weeds, they help keep uh, the soil cooler and conserve water. And it also, as it breaks down, does provide a source of organic matter to the soil ecosystem. You can also use compost, uh, leaves, clean herbicide free straw you can use as a mulch. And you can also just leave things lay where they fall. I mentioned that earlier when we talked about uh, cleaning up the garden, let the plants provide their own mulch for where they grow. Plants can also be used as a ground cover. 
uh, use plants that have lower growing habits or have an opposite growth habit from the plant that you want to grow, they're going to provide more inputs into that uh, eco soil ecosystem as well. And I mentioned it earlier, but it doesn't hurt to mention again, you know, uh, covering the soil with mulch or rocks or things like that, you're not giving insects any access to that soil. So if you have spots in your yard, try to pull away that mulch from the soil and see what happens. See if you're able to welcome any native bees into your landscape. All right, the last element into welcoming nature into our landscape is using our resources while, wisely. First, when we talk about water, um, selecting native plants or plants for your correct location, for, your, for their water needs or for what you're willing to do for them is the first step. You know, native plants are going to use less water over the long run. Now, I'm not saying that when you establish new plants or trees or even for your vegetable garden that you can't water it. But if you're out there every day watering, um, let's say you planted swamp milkweed in a sandy soil and it's just not doing well and you're watering every day, that might not be the best use of our resources. If you water, uh, use try to, uh, if you use a sprinkler system, make sure that you go and do an audit. I know landscape companies will do this as well, but basically, basically just make sure all your sprinkler heads are actually pointing where you want them to be and not on the concrete. Uh, put out a little rain gauge or a little cup to measure how much water is being put out so that you're watering correctly. We're talking in terms of gardens or perennial beds. You can use drip hose or soaker hose to get that water right where it needs to go. If you are using overhead sprinkler irrigation, make sure that you're watering in the morning uh, so the leaves have time to dry off and that water isn't wasted through evaporation if you were doing it later on in the day. And um, you can also look at incorporating uh, rain gardens. There are areas that just collect water after rain and they let it, to, let it soak into the soil profile. You plant plants in there that are used to different fluctuations in water levels as well. Rainwater collection is also something you can keep in mind. I know there's lots of different um, information and sides out there as if as if you should or shouldn't, if it's okay for vegetable gardens. And I was hoping Julie would be on today to help field some of those questions because I couldn't quite get to uh, the, an answer that I was satisfied with. But you can collect rainwater. Uh, check your local codes. There might be restrictions on how much you can, can collect and things like that. But using rainwater to water your perennial gardens or your landscape plants is good. Uh, when in terms of talking about vegetable gardens, you know, there's uh, things that you can do to help make sure the water is a little bit more safe. They make uh, first flush uh, valves that allow that first flush to come off the roof. And then the, the remaining water is ideally a little bit more clean and it will, uh, you can use that to water your garden are using it to water, um, trying not to get it on the leaves or what you're eating, which is ideally, ideally you're supposed to get it on the soil or watering or when you water way today and then harvest. But like I said, I'm not, um, I'm not hundred percent, hundred percent sure on those details. So contact your local extension office if you want more information on that. We talked about fertilizer, uh, get a soil test done so that we're not wasting nutrients. You know, a part of what we apply. We want it to go into the soil and to be used. We don't want it to run off into our lakes and rivers. And finally, pesticides. You've spent all this time getting your garden ready, doing these practices, and then we use pesticides to get rid of aphids that might be on our dill plant. So if we do need to use something, uh, first try to use a non- chemical, non-lethal method. Maybe it's just waiting and see what mother nature does. Maybe it's using a jet of water. And if there's really something that's going on, then use your pesticides, but make sure you're using low-risk pesticides first or just not using them at all, especially if you're welcoming pollinators and insects into your landscape. 
So planning, we've gone through a lot of information today. I want you to take some time and just kind of reflect, like what's your purpose or goal of your landscape? Is it, um, do you have children? Do you have pets? Are you working at vegetable production? Or do you really want to welcome wildlife into your landscape? Jot down some ideas, maybe draw out your landscape just on a piece of paper and put some notes down of a couple concrete steps that you're going to do this year to welcome nature into your landscape. And as we wrap up, just some food for thought. Uh, you've spent some time welcoming nature into your landscape. You've maybe let those aphids go a little bit more on your dill and saw a huge uh, growth of the beetle, late multicolored lady Asian beetles that have came in and ate those aphids and you didn't have to spray anything. What does it matter? What What's it worth? Well, there's a couple different things that research has shown that wildlife gardening or having varied landscapes does for us. According to Kelsey and Manning in 2010, gardening with nature brings us closer in contact with the natural world. We spend more time observing and making decisions on what's going around us. And research also shows that people get a greater psychological benefit from green spaces that are biologically complex. So adding that diversity for wildlife, we get a better we get a benefit out of it as well. And according to Lindemann and Matthews and Marty, in 2013, re research also shows that people's aesthetic appreciation for green spaces increases with species ri richness. So we intuitively know that having diversity is great. But what will the neighbors think is kind of a common question, or what do other gardeners think? And a similar study by Linnem and Matthews and Marty in 2013, the results indicated that only 22% of the gardeners in the study cared about what others thought about their garden. So gardeners, it really doesn't matter what we feel like others think. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. And in fact, very few gardeners in the survey were bothered by a wild garden in their neighborhood. So I think it gives us permission to welcome nature into our landscape. Our actions all have impacts. It doesn't mean wildlife landscaping isn't an excuse to just let everything grow wild. It might look like that, but by adding uh, clean edges or fences or structures that help people know that someone does care about this garden will give the impression uh, that it's not too wild for us. An important thing to note is we can be the agents of change. What we do in our backyard, other gardeners will see and they will mimic and start trying on their own. Trying on their own, excuse me. So start a trend in your neighborhood and some practices that welcome nature and see what happens. So there, I'm all wrapped up, Scott. There's my contact information if anyone has questions. Terry, what you kind of were talking about there at the end is what uh, we've kind of thought about at my house a few times is is the natural landscape a little bit more and um, the natural gardens and, and less mowing, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest question is, like you said, how do we talk to our neighbors or I, I don't know if you have any advice or if you ever talk to any people who you help out, like how do they uh, approach approach their neighbors and maybe explain what they're doing? Or are, aren't there, I think I've seen some places where you can buy signs that might say that's a, a natural garden of some mm -hmm. sort or explaining mm -hmm. kind of what your lawn looks like. Mm -hmm. and I think that kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier when we started, like everyone has their own vision of what their garden looks like or how things to look at. They have their own belief systems, but I think just kind of sharing. Um, I, I've just shared it today at work as we were talking about, I was doing this presentation that I said, I'm not, I'm not cleaning up my, my perennials. I'm not cleaning up uh, the debris around them this year. I'm going to leave them, let them lay uh, where they fall and see what happens. And just kind of giving people, people the permission to try something different, even though it might look messy, just say, Hey, it's for the pollinators. I'm trying to welcome wildlife. Did you know, um, and just kind of start that way. Start with no judgment. I mean, that's people have their own ways they want to do things too. So, yeah, that's I've seen those signs, the pollinator ones. That's, yep. that's a good one. All right, we got some questions coming in now. Just need to give them some time. So, I'm just going to go to the one first here that's in the Q and A. Do you know a good source of seed? 
for native plants? A good source to find that seed? A good source of seed. Um, that is a great question. And it's something that I didn't mention earlier. When you're looking for seed, try to find a seed source that's close to your location because that seed is uh, going to, from your area, it's going to grow well, especially if it's produced in that area. The one native seed source that I can think of is Prairie Moon Nursery. I believe that's in Minnesota. That would be a good place to look at as well. I'm drawing a blank on some of the other ones at this time. All right, next one here. Do milkweed plants have to be in close proximity? Could they be in various gardens, maybe up to 40 feet apart? Oh, that's a really good question. How far do the milkweeds have to be apart? Um, I think, like I mentioned, just having one in your backyard isn't going to be enough to attract them. So if you have multiple in your backyard, that works. And then if your neighbor maybe has multiple in their backyard as well, it allows that wildlife to kind of hop from one habitat to the other. I don't know of any distances. I haven't looked at that. All right. Good, good. The next one. Um, this person was just kind of wanting to have you talk a bit more about rainwater versus regular water because they thought that they've heard that rainwater is better for the plant. You know, I, we've all heard those anecdotes as to rainwater is better. I think rainwater is better too, depending on where you're at. There are some areas that might have a slightly acidic rainwater too. So uh, we nature's a balance. So we want to have a balance of everything as well. Uh, if we're watering, if you're in a drought and you're watering with uh, treated water, you might unintentionally get some side effects from that as well. Uh, and so rainwater is the best that we can do, but you might have to irrigate as well. So I don't know if I answered that one. I kind of skirted that question, I think. It depends on a lot of things. So it's hard to have a, a strict answer. Could you talk a little bit more about bee lawns? Okay. So bee lawns are typically a fine fescue grass just because it, it's not as needy as a blue Kentucky grass or Kentucky bluegrass mix. It doesn't need a, as lot of, as much maintenance. And then you would mix some clover in there and some self heal is the name of the flower. Um, University of Minnesota Extension has done a lot of great research into bee lawns. So you could Google their information as well. And you typically won't mow a bee lawn as much. Uh, you will get, you're gonna let, you wanna let those plants flower and grow. If you use leaves or grass for the mulch, wouldn't that mat it down, especially if it was wet? Uh, so that would depend on the situation too. Um, if you are using it like in a garden setting and you know how thick you're going to put it down to will affect that as well. So definitely if you're using mulch in a vegetable garden setting, you want to pull that away from where you're planting your seeds so the seeds can come up. If you're talking about perennials, um, a lot of perennials are going to have tough shoots that are going to be able to push from that through that. Um, I haven't really, I don't have a lot of leaf debris that have accumulated in my yard, but everything that I grow, it usually can push through it pretty well. All right. Uh, this one, going back to the milkweed a little bit, um, this person is saying that their milkweed spreads. So she says, you know, some are, some are more uh, invasive than, other, than others. Yep. And I think uh, it depends, like swamp milkweed. I've had that in my yard for a while. It doesn't spread. I've even left the seed pods on there to try to get it to spread a little bit more and it hasn't spread. So each plant is going to have its own characteristics for spreading. I'm going to do my best to read this. So this person, they neglected a beachfront flower garden at Metagoshi, but they found out how beneficial it was to have native plants growing in it. The worst example was yellow clover that grew to about six feet tall and in about a two foot circle, I would assume, or six feet tall and in about a two foot circle. Yep. When I finally got to caring for this area, I found hundreds of bees eating to their heart's content. It killed them to have to destroy the plants for their neighbors. Is there an appropriate place to hide the clover? <laughs> Hiding plants. That's a really good question. That's a really tall cl uh, clover plant. Uh, is there a way that you could um, get the clover somewhere else in your landscape? And why did you have to 
to tear it down? Was it really a distraction to your neighbors? I mean, just maybe having a conversation with them as to why it's there. I, I find that just talking to people about pollinators and explaining why they need this resource helps maybe break down some of those gaps as well. Or bring them over to let them see the yeah bounty of bees that are enjoying that and see if they'd want to stay. Or maybe they would not want to stay, depending on the person. Maybe they wouldn't want to have those other bees around. Yep, sometimes bees are scary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, another one here. The This person's found out that when the... The leaves are matted. The water may have difficulty seeping through to the roots. Yep, that could be too. It kind of gets too compacted, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That can happen, especially if there's a lot of cover. But, I mean, you can go in there and pull it away from the crown of the plant, too. So, at least the water is getting down into the base of the plant where it needs to go. And the leaves are acting as, as mulch outside of the plants to help stop those weeds from growing. It's not a perfect system. There's trial and error with everything we do. Everyone has their own different microclimates and growing conditions. And so you just have to find what works best for you. Yeah, a couple of comments coming in from the from the responses you've had and similar to the not so perfect system, the 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 one was saying that the common milk milkweed is the invasive one, of course, that yep, they were correct. dealing with. And that the the uh, lady who had the issues having to tear it down for the neighbors is just that their neighbors really appreciate their picture perfect oh. green lawns and gotcha just some thank yous for you carrie for yeah hopefully job. everybody enjoyed it one thing that we can do to help uh nature in our landscape so thank you mm -hmm.